The following presentation was made possible by supporters like you. Consider making an impact today by honoring Science for Georgia with a gift or by joining our Catalyzer Network. Thank you and enjoy. So I'm Daniel. Um, you know, we'll have time at the end for questions and stuff like that. But you, if you all have a, a burning question in the middle of the presentation, don't be afraid to throw your hand up. Happy to answer them whenever. Um, this is going to be a, just a kind of fun, free flowing conversation. Um, but you know, I I'm an, yeah was in academia, grad school, all that jazz. And usually, whenever like people have been ac in academia or other scientists learn that you know I'm able to work as a full-time scientist at a brewery the reaction that I get probably 99 percent of the time is um, that's an option <laughs> uh, turns out it is uh, creature comforts we actually have five full-time scientists on staff um, I'm just one of them and I would argue that it is actually one of the original sciences uh, so this right here is actually the lab at Carlsberg Brewing in Copenhagen. Uh, it is one of the original science labs. Uh, this lab, this building right here, uh, it's where the first microorganism was isolated. Louis Pasteur, isolated brewing yeast. Uh, they also created the pH scale, a brewery. Uh, they've come up with all kinds of other things over the years. Uh, the Keldahl method, for those of you who know, it's a really, really common method for quantifying nitrogen. That also came out of Carlsberg. Uh, and most recently, they were part of the consortium that sequenced the barley genome. Uh, it's actually in Carlsberg's like company documents that they have to spend X percentage of their profits on their lab. Uh, you can actually get a PhD in their lab. It's that good. <laughs> uh, it's, it's incredible. So brewing science, it's really one of those original brewing or original sciences uh, in general. Um, but you know, like why, why would a brewery need a, a scientist, you know, in, for hundreds of years? You know, this, is, this hasn't been strange for the industry. Um, Brewing isn't like other manufacturing. You know, we're not like Ford or GM where we're taking the same nuts and bolts and pieces of glass and metal and putting them together into a product. We're working with raw agricultural products. Barley, hops, things like that. They change every single year. Every single year, they change. And that's part of it. Flow with the seasons, flow with the ingredients. Uh, in Clark County, uh, we have two different water sources uh, for the county. We can actually tell in our testing in the lab when the county switches from one source to the other. We have to adjust. We have to adjust every single year. And so consumers, a lot of times they ask us, like, oh, have you ever changed the recipe of Tropicalia and stuff like that? And, you know, if it was just one to calm their nerves, you know, I'd say, oh, no, never. Um, we'd be really terrible brewers if we didn't. Because the recipe isn't what matters, it's the final product that matters. Our ingredients change all the time. So if we didn't adjust our recipes, the beer would change all the time. Uh, so that's really where the lab comes in. It's bringing consistency to this incredibly chaotic process. Um, you know, a lot of it's determined by the yeast. They have a mind of their own. You wouldn't think it, they don't have neurons, but they've got a mind of their own. <laughs> They'll do whatever the heck they want. Uh, and so there's all these different variables that go into it, and that's where the quality lab comes in. That's where the science comes in. It's bringing that consistency to where, you know, whatever the ingredients are, whatever, you know, season we're in, whatever we're dealing with, that we can produce that exact same beer on the other end. Uh, but don't, don't I miss academia? You know, academia is nice. It's, it's a fantastic bubble. I love the academia bubble. Um, you know, you get to study, you know, whatever you want for decades, uh, get paid to do it. Um, I wanted to join academia for a while. Um, you know, I love the, I love the openness of academia, the collaboration, you know, the fact that you can just share everything you know with everyone that's, you know, actually required part of it. Um, but I would argue that brewing is, possibly the only private industry that has all the same benefits of academia. And it's one of the reasons why I love it. So we have many, many, many different professional societies uh, for both scientists in beer, um, American Society of Brewing Chemists, uh, 
they produce a journal. We also have a yearly conference. It's one of my favorite conferences that I've ever been to. Um, you know, we all have a good time. You know, like, we're not kidding ourselves. We're not curing breast cancer. We're making beer. You know, so let's let's have a good time while we do it. Um, this was from yeah. This was from the conference last year up in Rhode Island. Uh, this year's in Pittsburgh. Um, it's just all the brewing geeks in the U.S. We all get together and we have a, a, more than a few beers together and we talk science. It's it's a lot of fun. Um, the Master Brewers Association of the Americas. I, I absolutely love their tagline, United We Brew. Uh, because it's it's together. It's together. Um, we're all working together, you know, craft beer, you know, it's still it's just a fraction of the size of the big guys, you know. So there's the competition isn't between us, the competition's with Budweiser. <laughs> and so uh, we all help each other. Uh, you know, the the MBAA, they have their own journal, they have their own podcast, uh, they have uh, different guilds, so there is the Georgia Master Brewers Association America's Guild. Um, just had uh, a big uh, fall show uh, in November here in Atlanta. A bunch of Georgia brewers got together, chatted about processes and things like that. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, this is a big one. Uh, the Hop Quality Group. Uh, you see little creature comforts, we're right there. Uh, but all of these breweries, um, Whenever Anheuser-Busch was bought by InBev and they stopped investing in hop research and stuff like that, all a, a lot of craft brewers, we got together and we were like, well, guess we're doing it ourselves now. Uh, and so we actually fund research. Uh, we fund an entire hop breeding program. Uh, and that's all done by craft brewers and it's done collaboratively. Actually, just on, uh, well, just yesterday, uh, we had our annual meeting. Um, so uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. We get to work with, you know, a whole bunch of different brewers, you know, everyone from, you know, Places that are big as Bells in New Belgium, you know, down to some of the smallest, coolest breweries uh, in the United States. Uh, and that's not all. I, I mean, the Japan, they have their own society of brewing chemists. Um, they do some really weird shit. It's pretty cool. Um, the Germans have their own called Brauwelt. There's even the Malsters Guild. There's a Hop Research Council, which is similar to the Hop Quality Group, but more for growers. Um, and then, of course, the Brewers Association. Uh, it's a, a huge uh, industry advocate for all, uh, all brewers in the United States. So we have a lot of these same societies. It's a lot of the same collaborative nature. Um, and it's always been that way. It's always been that way. Uh, so this is fantastic. If you can read it, this is the Brewer's Guardian. It says, established 1871, published on the evenings of every alternate Tuesday. I've read many, many issues of this. Um, I, I'm a history buff. I love it. Um, it's it's fascinating. Every 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 other Tuesday, they, they would come out with this. It's about six to eight pages. It would have two to three scientific journal articles. Uh, it would have at least one thing o uh, covering whatever parliament was doing at the time. It would have one opinion piece, which was usually complaining about what parliament was doing at the time. Um, and then it would have advertisements, um, you know, for like tiles on a malting floor. Um, said their, their best quality was they were very smooth. <laughs> but, uh, it, it's always been that way. Brewer, it, brewing has always been a very collaborative industry. Uh, and that part of that is just beer's always best when it's fresh and it's best when it's local. Uh, it doesn't travel particularly well. And so it doesn't really make sense for brewers who are, you know, vastly different locations. You know, they're not going to be competing with each other. So you might as well help each other. Um, so, nah. <laughs> um, this is the team. This is uh, the team of scientists at Creature Comforts. Uh, we've got five full-time, myself, Spencer Britton, Anna Birnbaum, Rob Schutz, and Jack Pendergast. Uh, Brie Radel uh, is uh, part-time. She's our application development manager. Uh, and this is the team. So it, there is a role uh, for scientists in brewing, and in fact, multiple roles uh, at our brewery alone. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, it, it is a lot of fun. Um, this is the lab space that we work in. Uh, this is just one view of it. Uh, and this is kind of what Bree does. So she's all on our SQL database side and our progressive web app. Uh, so this is every single tank in the brewery down to every facility. You know, we're tracking every single metric and it's all plugged in there and that's all um, programming that Bree has worked on extensively. Um, if any of you want to see like an actual like video of the entire lab, you're more than welcome to. It's there on YouTube, um, the quality, uh, uh, QC2, um, Quality Control Collaboratory up in Maine. Um, they did a videos with a bunch of different breweries across the U.S. We're just one of them. Um, it, it's a lot of fun. Um, so what do we actually do when we're talking about science in beer? 
Well, the ASBC, the American Society of Brewing Chemists, they have standard methods uh, for any brewery to test raw ingredients, beer in process, final beer, whatever. Um, they have uh, over 350 of those. Uh, we can run the vast majority of them in our lab out in Athens. Um, and in fact, a typical batch of Tropicalia is gonna undergo about 120 different tests in our hands before it leaves the facility. Uh, we break the lab down into four areas of focus, uh, analytical, microbiological, packaging, sensory, and we actually rotate our duties. Uh, so someone will be analytical for a week or two, then micro, then packaging, uh, and sensory, stuff like that. Um, and what's fun about it is we're one of the only departments that actually gets to interact with every single other department in the company. Uh, we get to interact with the brewers, the, f the seller folks, the, pa the packagers. Um, we get to even interact with marketing. If you all ever see a post, you know, advertising a new beer that we came out with or anything like that, they specifically got clearance from the quality lab that that post was okay to move forward with. Uh, so we're one of the only ones. We're interacting with everyone. Uh, it, it really makes it a lot of fun. Uh, it enhances that collaborative nature, uh, you know, just like academia. Is, it's what I love. Um, but the different realms of the lab, like what, what actual tests are we doing? When we say those 120 different tests on Tropicalia, you know, what do those actually comprise? Uh, well, in the analytical realm, this is really just things that can have a hard number put to them. Uh, that's a lot of different things. So we've got a machine called Anton Parr, DMA 4500. Um, this measuring density, ABV, and pH. So we look at every single fermenting batch every single day, uh, and we're just measuring how's it fermenting. Are the yeast doing what we need them to do, chewing up the sugars, creating alcohol, everything like that. Um, pH is really important to have a package-stable product to make sure it's safe. You know, there's nothing that can grow in beer that'll make you sick if it was done right. It's one of the reasons why we've been drinking it for thousands of years, um, but we check all that. Uh, we also have a GCMS, which is a lot of fun. Um, it's one of my favorite toys in the lab. Uh, we also have an ECD slapped on it. Uh, we can actually quantify pretty much uh, all the major aromatic compounds with this machine, uh, down to the parts per trillion if we really want to. Um, and so with that, you know, we're measuring, making sure that everything's within specifications. You know, the aroma is exactly what we want it to be. And then we have a boatload of other stuff. Um, we can measure everything from haze. ATP is actually a really good readout uh, for cleanliness. Um, if you find ATP anywhere, something living is there. And as a brewer, that's scary. Um, gases, you know, beard's a carbonated product. Um, so we do a lot of work with gases, carbonation, dissolved oxygen, stuff like that. Um, and then little things like UV viz, uh, spectrophotometer, things like that. The ASBC sends a lot of their general protocols through that so we can measure free amino nitrogen, um, you know, bittering units, all sorts of stuff with that. Um, but it's a lot of fun. On the micro side, uh, we actually have two really large areas of focus. Um, and so one of them is contamination. So we're checking every single batch at various points to make sure that there's no like weird organism coming into our beer. You know, at the end of the day, when we send beer into a fermenter, it's sugar water. A lot of things want to grow in sugar water. And they're very happy to chew on it. Uh, so we need to make sure that nothing weird is in there. Um, and then we're doing you know, various different plates, petri dishes, things like that. Uh, we'll run qPCR, and we even do genetic sequencing uh, if we need to to figure out you know, what something is or you know, keep track of various things. Um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, but the other half of it is the yeast health. You know, we're generating wort, and we are then handing it off to yeast. Uh, the really um, kind of famous saying in the industry is brewers make wort, yeast make beer. Um, and so there are some samples in the back, if we could spread them around. I brought, um, anyone can try these. Uh, this is, uh, if you've had uh, Bebo, our classic Pilsner, um, this is Bebo wort. Um, so that's, this is what comes out of our brew house before it goes to a fermenter. This is, uh, there's no alcohol in it, so anyone can drink this, feel free. It, it is very sugary, um, so keep that in mind. Um, the only difference between this and if you buy a can of Bebo um, at the grocery store, get a pint uh, at a bar, is yeast. Yeast take this, they make the beer. Um, you can try it if you want. Um, it's not terribly good. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's going to be water, uh, sugar from the malt, um, and a little bit of hops. That's it. Yep. Uh, it's really bitter. 
it's kind of it, it's an odd combination of like really bitter and cloyingly sweet. Um, and I think we could all agree that like drinking an entire pint of this would probably be pretty painful and not enjoyable. Um, so thank you to the yeast. Uh, they do a lot of our work for us. Uh, these are just two uh, yeast brinks uh, that we have at our main brewing facility in Athens. And so we'll actually harvest yeast off of beers and we'll pitch it into the next brew. The general rule of thumb in the brewing industry is that you do that about 10 batches um, before you start to get some weird genetic drift and you need to go back to a mother culture. Um, but we'll harvest yeast into these tanks and we actually have an automated yeast pitching system that will, it counts every single cell as it goes into the tank and it'll pitch the exact number of cells that we want in that tank. Um, so that's the micro side, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, the, the yeasts are doing a lot for us. We're just making the work. Packaging is a huge, huge, huge part of the quality control lab. Um, it is an incredibly complicated process, um, and there are a lot of things that can go wrong. I mean, a lot of things that can go wrong um, in packaging. Uh, so we have to keep a very close eye on it. Um, we're checking, of course, fill heights, uh, you know, for low fills and stuff like that, but also can seams. So we'll actually cut cans open and take a picture um, and actually measure the seams. Uh, we look at about uh, seven different metrics on that seam, all down to the thousandth of an inch, um, making sure that everything's uh, good and it's not going to leak or anything like that. We're also looking and making sure our kegs are clean. Um, kegs are a, a really interesting part of the industry. You know, they're, they're great for sustainability. You know, we reuse them. You can use a keg uh, for decades if you take care of it well with uh, replacing the gaskets and things like that. Um, but that also means you need to take good care of it, keep it clean, everything like that. Uh, we have test kegs. Uh, this is one of them. So it's just absolutely chock full of sensors for temperature and pressure and fill and all sorts of stuff. Um, so we'll use that to make sure that we're um, actually uh, getting clean kegs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so they did a couple different tricks uh, back in the day. Um, it, in general, yeah, they, they almost assuredly had funkier fermentations with some bacteria and stuff in there, so their beers were probably a little bit more sour, a little bit tart. Um, but they, they also understood yeast handling, so they would typically pitch their yeast from like an active fermentation into another one. Um, the yeast will outcompete a lot of things. Um, so if you get really good yeast in there um, very early, um, so that's one reason why some of the classical styles, like part of the recipe is adding other beer. Um, really what they were doing was that they were looking to add the yeast. They didn't know it at the time, but that's what they were doing. Um, so yeah, based on the handle, that they could use the yeast to outcompete organisms, but yeah, almost as surely their stuff was probably a little bit funkier. Um, there's, some, there's some really interesting brewing that's done um, in Norway where they have a particular strains of yeast that replicate incredibly quickly and they're actually able to get clean fermentations and they have for hundreds of years um, because that yeast grows so freaking fast. Um, but Kveik strains, um, they're, they're fun. Um, but yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, we actually, in that same vein, um, We'll purposely age hops uh, at Creature for certain beers. Um, you know, for all our beers like Tropicalia and IPAs and things like that, um, our hops, they're harvested. We are, they're very quickly cooled. They're pelletized. They're stored under a nitrogen environment, no oxygen. They're put in a freezer. They're shipped to us on a f in a freezer truck. We put them in a freezer on site. You know, it's cold, 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 all the way around to keep them fresh and make those nice, juicy IPAs that we like. Um, you couldn't do that before there were refrigerators. Um, and so a lot of the classic styles, you know, they used aged hops. You know, they still only had one hop harvest season a year, and then they had to use those hops the, the whole year, just like we do. Um, but they weren't able to keep them cool. And so we'll actually purposely take hops and store them warm so we can recreate those old styles, because that's what they worked with. Um, yeah, the keg cleaning, it, it's a lot of fun. Um, we are trying to keep things clean. We don't want our beer to get too funky and get bacteria in there. Um, I will say, uh, 
I know if you go out and you know, you get a keg for a party, you put down probably a $50 deposit, and you're like, oh, if I don't return the keg, it's not that big of a deal. Kegs cost like $150, $200. Um, so if you do that, do it with like a Budweiser keg. <laughs> don't, don't steal it from a craft brewery. That's it, it, Yeah, that's kind of a punch in the gut. <laughs> they're, they're probably losing a couple hundred bucks if you do that. Um, yes and no. <laughs> uh, so the question, are bottles easier than, than cans? Um, in some ways, yes. Um, it's much easier to get very low oxygen levels in a bottle. Um, and oxygen levels are incredibly important, especially for hoppy beers. Uh, so putting hoppy beers into a bottle makes a lot of sense. Um, from a food safety perspective, they're a lot, lot, lot scarier than cans. Um, it's really common for bottles to have, you know, incredibly small defects that can lead to flaking, to, can lead to pieces of glass in the product. Um, you know, beer, like I said, beer, it, it's naturally safe for people if it's done correctly. You know, low pH, alcohol, hops are actually mi antimicrobial. Um, so there's nothing that'll grow in beer that'll make you sick if it's done right. But if there's a piece of glass or metal in there, that's terrifying for a brewer's perspective perspective. It's one of the only things we can do that could actually hurt people. Um, and so we're hyper, hyper aware of it. Personally, I'm glad that we don't do a lot of bottling at Creature. It'd probably give me nightmares uh, having to think about all those bottles and the checks that you have to do. Um, so yeah, in some ways, yes, much better. Um, in other ways, they're a little bit scarier. So um, yeah, great question. Um, in that realm, uh, it, packaging, uh, we're absolutely ruthless when it comes to battling oxygen. Oxygen has a huge, huge role to play in how beer ages over time. Um, vast majority of time, it's bad. Uh, we don't want oxygen in our package if we can help it. And so we're actually targeting less than 50 parts per billion in our package. Usually we're less than 20. Um, there are uh, some things that lead to you know storage and stuff if you have a high oxygen um, we'll talk about that in a little bit but um, it's one of the things that we're most concerned about uh, at the brewery and then of course there's sensory that's the one everyone asks about they're like oh you're a scientist who works at a brewery that just means you drink all day right it's like well a little bit but not as much as you'd think um, but it is the most important test of all like I said the, you know the ASBC lists those 350 different tests that we could be running at the brewery but at the end of the day, like every single one of those is just trying to lead you to what does it taste like? So we taste it. Uh, every single batch of beer that we brew is going to go in front of our official sensory panel. Uh, those panelists, they go undergo at minimum, at absolute bare minimum, 16 hours worth of training. Uh, that class, I put it on a couple times a year, only about a third of people pass it. It's purposely hard. Um, if I put on a class for 15 people, there might be two or three that eventually are good enough to be, become part of our panel. Um, we keep them on their toes. Uh, we'll present beers to them, and we'll actually, we call them spikes, and we'll purposely change those beers. Uh, we might change the appearance, we might change the aroma, we might change the flavor. I might give them a beer and say, what do you think of this Bebo? It's actually Classic City Lager. I fully expect my panelists to fail it. I fully expect them to tell me it's Classic City Lager. Um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, the panelists are actually scored uh, on how well they do with those spikes. So they get uh, points for attendance, they get points for, pa or for failing spike beers, and they get extra points for actually correctly identifying the adulteration. Um, and we run three beer panels a week, uh, Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. And then we also have a hop panel. So every single shipment of hops that comes into our brewery, we're checking it. It automatically gets put on hold, and the hop panel has to physically clear those hops before they go into a single beer. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, but we say sensory is the most important because at the end of the day, you know, every single one of these tests is just leading to, what does it taste like? So whenever we're doing those panels, you can see in this picture right here that those little metal doors, um, reminiscent of you know sample collection ports at a doctor's office that's because that's exactly what it is um, on the other side of that we have four booths every single one is the exact same exact same environment exact same materials exact same exact same exact same uh, sensory it's a 
<laughs> we're messing. We're using human brains, and uh, human brains are kind of messy, um, and there are a lot of things that affect them. And so we need the exact same environment every time. Um, our panelists evaluate beer the exact same way every time. We give it the beers in very specific orders to make sure that they're not messing with the palates. Um, and they'll go in, and they have to drink whatever we put in front of them. Um, it's a lot of fun. Whereas we we're actually talking earlier. Um, in the lab, we actually like pumpkin beers. Um, every single brewer at Creature Comforts, for some reason, hates pumpkin beers. Um, we make them drink at least one pumpkin beer every single year uh, <laughs> whenever they come to sensory panel. Um, but this is the environment that our panelists are working in, and these are our panelists. Uh, so these are the people who, over the years, are making sure that Tropicalia this year is the same as Tropicalia last year is the same as Trop the year before. No matter what happened with the ingredients, no matter what happened with the seasons, no matter what happened with the water, whatever, it's the exact same. And these are the people keeping an eye on it. Um, Anna's down here, she's the newest addition to the panel. Um, these are the people, uh, every single batch of beer right down to our tiny little pilot batches. Um, it doesn't go out the door until they say so. So people say, oh, you drink beer, you, you must drink a lot of beer every day, yada, yada, yada. I don't, they do. <laughs> That's my panel. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, we do require our panelists to swallow the beer. Um, experience in carbonation is important, and you get a lot of that um, impact as it goes down your throat. Um, if people were able, to, if something were incredibly highly carbonated, it would probably be fine just to spit it back out and it wouldn't be unenjoyable, but if you had to swallow it and you're like, oh. <laughs> um, so yeah, we do actually require panelists to um, drink the beer. Um, we had one panelist who had late onset um, uh, celiacs, um, and he actually moved to just smelling the beer. Um, he was still really good at panel, <laughs> which uh, was a great for him. Be a little bit annoying because then all the other panels are like, "Why are we swallowing this?" <laughs> it's like, uh, but uh, yeah, great question. Yeah, we 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 do swallow samples, and actually later on, uh, you all are going to get to evaluate um, whatever drink you have in front of you um, in the exact same way that our panel does. Uh, we recognize uh, the top panelists. Um, so every single month, we recognize who the top three uh, for the previous month. So whatever month this was. Uh, Aaron was our, our sensory queen, Katie right behind her, Steve uh, behind them. Um, actually, Aaron, if you, we recognize the best attendance and the best scores over the course of the entire year. Um, if you look at all the names on here, actually hers is on there the most, so she's arguably our best panelist of all time. Um, we just rolled out the, the new ones for 2022. Um, I was second. I was really happy about that. I was, man, I, I can't be the one teaching the sensory classes and not actually be good at this. That'd be terrible. <laughs> Yeah, so they're scored on three metrics. They're scored on attendance, they're scored on whether they um, correctly fail beers that I want them to fail, and whether they correctly identify why that beer should be failed. Um, and it's an ongoing 90-day window. I don't, get, I don't care what they did 91 days ago. Uh, show me what you did in the past three months. Um, we spoke about the hop panel that we put on. Uh, so we're one of the, if not the only brewery that I know of that has its own hop sensory panel. Um, we're a pretty hop forward brewery, brewery. We make a lot of IPAs, we like messing with hops. And so the hops are important to us. Um, so actually the, the panelists who are best at hop panel, they're the ones that go out and select our hops every single year during harvest. So brewers will actually contract out hops uh, up to three, four, five years in advance. Um, hops are incredibly labor intensive for the farmers to grow. Uh, they have to put in rhizomes, they have to put in you know, all these trellises. It's an incredible amount of infrastructure. And so it's really important for them to know the varieties that they should be growing. Um, and so it's mutually beneficial for us to contract with the growers so they know what they need to grow. And also that way it's ready for us when we want it in a couple years. Uh, if you contract out large enough uh, lots, you can actually select your lot uh, during harvest. And so you go out to the Pacific Northwest where the vast majority of hops in the U.S. are grown. Uh, Washington is the big one, Oregon and Idaho uh, behind that. Um, and you will go to the growers and you'll actually say, okay, I want this lot. Um, so our top hop panelists are actually the ones that get to go out and do that. Um, here we are, 
um, at Yakima Chief. Uh, this was during selection uh, last year. Um, this is at a farm, uh, actually looking at hop cones. Uh, and this is actually the cones being taken off the bind. Uh, this is at Crosby. Um, Hop lots are fun. Uh, when I say, you know, things change from year to year to year. You know, these are raw agricultural ingredients. When we say a hop lot and what we're actually contracting for, it's not only down to just that, you know, we're getting cascade from, you know, Crosby Farms. It is down to the field and the day that it was harvested. That's how specific it gets. You can have the exact same field harvested 24 hours later and it'll smell completely differently. And so we're going out there and we're selecting very, very, very specific lots. Um, it's uh, really important to us. It's one of the most expensive raw ingredients that we have. Um, a typical box of hops, you know, it's about and $600. Um, they're not cheap. Uh, we've used uh, one variety of hop that costs us $32 a pound. Uh, it literally would have been cheaper for us to put filet mignon in that beer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a great question. You know a lot about this. <laughs> so hops, they start off as a cone. It's a flower. Um, and then uh, they'll be pulled off the binds, uh, kilned, dried, and then they're actually pelletized. Um, the pellets are maybe a quarter of an inch wide, and they vary in length depending on how they broke, but typically, you know, anywhere from a quarter of an inch to half an inch long. Um, the pelletizing comes back to that oxygen. No oxygen, no oxygen, no oxygen. Um, we want to protect the hops from oxygen. Um, so by packing them tight into a pellet, um, you're reducing the surface area, and it leads to much better storage. Uh, then they're put into mylar bags, and then those bags are actually purged of oxygen as well. And then they're put in a freezer. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, they go through a hammer mill. Yep. There is no coating on the outside of the pellet. Yep, yep, uh, it's simply pressured and pressed um, and yeah, spits out the other end. Yep, yeah, no coating on them whatsoever. Yep. Yep, yep, freezing and lack of oxygen. Yep, great question. Anyone else? Hops? Hops are fun. <laughs> yep, yeah, question, does anyone use unpelletized hops in just the whole cone? Uh, yes, uh, Sierra Nevada very famously does. Um, they use almost exclusively whole cone. Um, they, I have watched them put pellets into a beer. Um, so <laughs> they like to say they only use uh, cones, uh, which they do for the vast majority of their beers. Um, but yeah, Sierra Nevada very famously uses almost exclusively whole cone. Um, they've done that just for kind of traditional reasons. Um, and uh, so they're actually working with a very large bales of hops that are being broken up and stuff like that. Um, but it's a it's a pretty labor intensive process. They're difficult to work with. Um, if you ever see uh, a wet hop ale or a wet ale, um, then that used whole cone hops as well um, to be considered a wet ale. It, they're pretty rare to find in Georgia since we're so far away from the Pacific Northwest. But to be considered a wet ale, um, the hops need to be used within 24 hours of harvest. Um, and to get those shipped here in time is wildly expensive. So most breweries here don't do it. Um, but if you ever go into the Pacific Northwest around September, October, definitely drink the wet hop ales. They're fun. Um, they're the freshest hops that you will literally ever get. How, okay, so the question is, how much beer will one box of hops yield? Um, that's a fantastic question. So the industry standard is that a box of hops will have uh, 44 pounds in it. And then brewers, we typically think of beer and the uh, barrels. Uh, so a barrel is 31 gallons. Uh, if you ever see a big keg at a bar, you know the one's about that tall, you know, about that wide. Uh, that's half of a barrel, so 15 and a half gallons. Um, it's really common for craft beers to have, you know, two to three pounds per barrel. Um, the really, 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 really big, like hazy IPAs, double IPAs, stuff like that, when the brewers are just like purposely being kind of ridiculous about it, um, might get up to like six pounds per barrel. Um, so if we're talking like two pounds per barrel, you know, one of those boxes will do about 22 barrels of beer. So, yep. Great question. So 
Oh, that's a yeah, fantastic question. So it, the question was, uh, what degree does artificial selection play in um, uh, leading to new hops? Um, it's huge. It's huge. Um, it takes uh, anywhere from 10 to 15 years to get a new hop variety uh, from when you start to when you finish. Uh, so just a, a couple weeks ago for uh, the hop quality group, we got in 18, I believe, samples of hops from the breeding program that uh, we sponsor and help, well, help sponsor. Um, and some of those, like those crosses were started, you know, back in like 2015 uh, and things like that. And they're just now getting to the point where we're smelling them. Um, so yeah, th th those selections are huge. There are several breeding programs across the world. Um, and hops, hops are really interesting. Um, they can range anywhere from, you know, like spicy and herbal and almost like tea, you know, up to like citrus and um, tropical, everything like that, all the way up to, um, there's a new variety out there called Zappa. Um, the, the descriptor for it is purple. <laughs> It smells like purple. <laughs> it's it's a fantastic hop. I love it. Um, but yeah, it's all that selective breeding and things like that. Um, the genetics of it isn't terribly well known right now. Um, so it's still kind of a more old style breeding program where you're just crossing and then seeing what you get. Um, so there isn't a whole lot of like actual purpose genetic kind of selection. Um, but yeah, a lot, lot of different um, things that go into the breeding. All right, sweet. Love hops. Um, Y'all want to drink something? All right. It doesn't have to be beer. Uh, I mean, personally, it's going to be beer. Um, but if you all want to evaluate things in like the super bougie way and the way our panel does, um, we can practice that uh, right now. And if you all wouldn't mind passing out the Skittles, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Um, the first taste is with your eyes. That's the first thing that you uh, experience with the beer is what does it look like? Um, so the first thing that we do when we're evaluating a beer is we're looking at it visually. We're checking for the color, the clarity, you know, is there any particulate in there? Is there supposed to be particulate in there? If there is, hooray. If there's not, boo. Um, it, what does the foam look like? How dense it is, is it? How does it stick to the side of the glass? You know, that's the lacing. Um, the bubble size as well, you know. Uh, is this exactly what we'd expect it to look like? So. First taste is always with their eyes. And then next we're gonna evaluate the aroma. So we use a couple different sniffs to help with that. Uh, the first one is just two short sniffs. Uh, you can do this in a couple different ways. You can do like a drive-by. Uh, you can do, you know, some people, they call them bunny sniffs, you know, kind of thing. Um, Personally, I like to bring it into my face in a way because if I leave it next to my face, I'm going to do a long sniff. I can't help myself. Um, uh, this really highlights small compounds. When I say small, I mean like molecular size, small compounds. Those things that are going into the air very, very easily, those are uh, the ones that come out in the short sniff. And so we're trying to pay attention to those small compounds. But then uh, we can get a long sniff in there. And this is going to highlight some of the larger compounds. And it's also going to help calibrate us to the room, kind of our, our own personal milieu that we're bringing to the mix. So. You can do a nice long sniff. Um, after that, we're, we're actually going to focus on the long sniff. So you can swirl. Um, our panel, they actually have little caps. Uh, our glasses and panel are very small. They only hold you know, about five ounces. Um, and we only fill them halfway. Uh, so we'll cap them, swirl it, kind of concentrate those aromas in the headspace, and then uh, go in for another long sniff. This is going to highlight a lot of the things that the yeast are bringing to the table. A lot of those esters and things like that. Um, also some fun hop compounds and stuff, but those, you know, that nice, nice long sniff. Um, and then after that, of course, everyone's favorite part, we get to drink it. Um, we try to cover about 75% of our palate. And we're going to take note of the flavor. Um, so when we're talking about flavor, you know, it's actually the things that our palate can do, you know, salt, sweet, umami, uh, bitter, things like that. We are actually going to swallow. And then afterwards, we're going to use a technique called retronasal breathing. And that's where after we swallowed, we're actually going to breathe back out through our nose and get the aroma another time. Now, 
I'm sure you're thinking, why the heck are we smelling this thing for the upteenth time? Um, trust me, there's a reason for it. All of you at each of your tables should have a cup of Skittles. Okay? Um, these are just regular Skittles. Um, but you'll notice they're gray. You're not going to know what flavor this is until you try it. So, to highlight retro nasal breathing, what we're going to do is we're going to hold our nose and pop this in our mouth and we're going to chew it. And you're going to see it only tastes sweet until you open your nose and breathe out through your nose. Yep, go ahead. I got orange. <laughs> Everyone see that? You weren't actually able to tell the flavor of it until you got the aroma. So smelling is actually incredibly important to how we experience things in our mouth. Okay? So that retronasal breathing, after we've swallowed, we'll breathe back out through our nose to get one more hit of that aroma and actually help us finish evaluating the beer as it went through our mouth. Um, it's also hitting another side of our palate. So it's coming into the back side of our palate instead of from the front. So a lot of times the aroma, you'll experience it a little bit differently. Certain compounds will present themselves in different ways. Um, so after that, um, when we're doing that, that breathing out, we'll, the first half of the breath, we breathe out through our nose. The second half of the breath, we actually breathe out over our tongue. And by doing that and passing air over tongue, you're able to evaluate the mouthfeel of the beer. Is it astringent? Is it like sticky sweet where it's like sticking on your tongue? You know, is it heavy? Is it light? That sort of thing. Um, so that's it. That's how we evaluate beer. Um, these steps are pretty standard in the industry. Uh, some breweries do more, some do less, um, but all of them essentially cover these basics. Um, if you're gonna evaluate beer, you know, uh, the bougie way, the way our panelists do, um, each one of these steps is important, and that's how we do it. Um, yeah, the Skittles are yours to have. Enjoy. <laughs> um, I'll see what I, I'm gonna try to get a grape. I like grape. My favorite beer? Oh man, second time I've gotten that question tonight. Um, <laughs> and why was it transmission? <laughs> oh man, transmission was a fantastic beer. Um, my uh, probably my favorite one that we do is a beer called Silent World. Uh, it's a black lager. I I don't know why I like it so much. Um, it's just really well balanced. Um, it's hilarious. We can we can see in the metrics because um, when we go to the tasting room, you know, of course, creatures, you know, our, our beers are comped and stuff like that. Well, we have to pay taxes on them, but that's it. Uh, and things, but you can actually see, you know, what employees at Creature Comforts drink. And we only do one batch of Silent World a year, and the employees, we probably drink like 60 to 70% of it. <laughs> um, we were supposed to brew it like two weeks ago, and they pushed the date back by a couple months, and I thought there was going to be a riot. Um, story beer cold. Okay. Sir, I don't know who was first. Fight it out. Yep, Tilray. No, no, there haven't been any discussions at Creature. Um, we're happy with what we do. You know, we're um, still a, a growing, healthy company. Um, I think some companies, uh, they're, they're, trying to pull any lever they can to generate more growth. It, it's it's nothing we've ever really discussed. Um, uh, it, it'll be interesting, you know, from a federal standpoint. Uh, it, it's definitely going to take change at the federal level before breweries can do anything in that realm. Um, there's one or two in Texas kind of flirting with the law in, in that regard um, with Delta 8 and things like that. But, yeah, it's, it's nothing we've ever been particularly interested in. Yeah, uh, we're talking just kind of surface area. Um, so we're trying to get enough in there to, you know, uh, hit all the receptors, but also not so much that we're choking. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's a fantastic question. Those in the back, if you couldn't hear, the question was the wort sample that we had earlier that was really sweet. You know, what is that sugar actually? Is it just like cane sugar or what? Um, that sugar is actually coming um, from the malt, from the grains that we use. Most of the grain that we use is barley, and it's specifically malted barley. Um, and we also use malted wheat. Uh, uh, malted barley and malted wheat is most of what goes into like Tropicalia. Um, and malting is a really, really specific process where the maltster, they will take the grain and they will steep it in water and then they'll allow it to sprout. Just a little bit, just a little bit. It'll actually get a little root lid on it. It'll get, get a little acrospire on the end. Um, and what's happening there is by allowing the grain to sprout, it's activating enzymes that are turning those complex sugars held in the starch and the grain into simple sugars that the plant can then use to grow. Those same sugars are the ones that yeast can turn into booze. Uh, so we'll buy malted grain. So um, I've actually, I've got some malted wheat in my car. If people want to try it uh, later on, I can go get it. Um, but you can actually see the difference between malted wheat and like flour. It's quite sweet. Um, and that's solely from the sprouting process and the activation of those enzymes. And then we'll actually, in the brew house, uh, we'll further utilize those enzymes. So based on the temperature that we steep that grain at the brew house, it'll uh, convert certain sugars to other sugars. And that temperature is incredibly specific. Um, we change it, you know, based on the brand, based on the beer, based on the recipe, you know, whatever. Um, and to get the exact sugar profile that we want. But yeah, that's a very long-winded way of saying uh, those sugars are coming from grain. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so, uh, you know, our question was, uh, our sensory panel, are they, you know, actually quantifying certain aromas and stuff like that? And would we ever use, like, non-humans <laughs> to, to measure some of those things? Um, our products are all hopefully experienced by humans, um, so we focus on just humans. Um, uh, as far as the quantification, um, we do actually have what we call an in-house oxidation scale. It's a ranking of one to 10, um, and that's uh, a way for us to actually show how beer is aging. Um, beer ages very quickly. Um, it's best fresh. And um, so we say five is our maximum allowable in market. So our panel, uh, we, th they will place things on that oxidation scale. Um, well, also, we use uh, what's called threshold. Um, so if you say 1x, that means for that compound, you know, it's generally accepted that most humans can smell it at, you know, 30 parts per billion or whatever. So 1x of that compound is 30 parts per billion. 2x is 60 parts per billion, you know, et cetera. Um, we don't require our panelists to, but sometimes they'll get cocky um, and do that. They'll be like, oh, acetaldehyde, 3.5x. <laughs> Um, so they'll, they'll do it. We don't require it of them. Um, now, when it comes to our panelists evaluating these aromas and compounds versus, um, you know, just doing it on a machine, that's another thing that people ask. It's like, if you've got this GCMS and you can just measure these things down to parts per trillion, why are you even bothering with the people? Um, the GCMS doesn't have a brain, um, and human palates and brains are weird. Uh, and so it can tell us the exact you know, numbers of compounds. It cannot tell us how those correlate and how a human experiences them. Uh, and so it really takes putting it in front of a bunch of people. And you saw the, the pictures. We purposely use a bunch of people. Um, sensory, it's, it, it's an incredibly individual um, experience. Every single one of us experiences things differently, um, sensory-wise, uh, based on our genetics, based on our background, based on you know our favorite foods when we grew up, based on what our grandma's house smelled like. Um, and so, part of the training uh, with our panelists is to actually get them all on the same vocabulary. You know, like personally, one of the compounds we train on it, it's cis-3-hexanol. Um, the commonly accepted descriptor for that compound is fresh cut grass. You put that compound in front of most people, they're like, yep, smells like grass clippings on my jean after I mowed the, after I mowed the yard. Um, me, personally, smells like potpourri in an antique shop in the holidays. No idea why. <laughs> 
Um, but that's how I experience it. And so I know when I get that aroma, that's this three hexanol. But if I had my panelist and, and one of them says, this smells like grass, another one says, this smells like potpourri, another one says, this smells like my grandma's house, that means nothing to me. Absolutely nothing. But if all three of them say, this beer has too much this three hexanol, I can work with that. Um, so a lot of the sensory training is really coming to this shared vocabulary. And so it's a really interesting human endeavor because every single person on our panel is experiencing that product differently. Um, but we all describe it in the same way. Okay, I don't know who was first, duke it out. <laughs> Yeah, is, is there anything to super tasters and have we ever evaluated our panelists in that regard? Yes. Um, every single spike that we have ever issued, I have the record of it. And so I know who is the strongest on every single compound that we test them on. Um, and people have their own strengths and weaknesses. Personally, I'm very strong with 2,3-butanedione, incredibly weak with butyric acid. Don't know why, that's just me. Um, one of the biggest defects, you know, is that 2,3-butane-dione. 20% of the human population straight up can't smell it. Some people can smell it down to 25 parts per billion. Um, we, one of our best panelists of all time, he worked in our maintenance department, smoked a pack of cigarettes a day. Um, he would come into panel reeking of cigarettes. I, it's very frustrating for me. Um, and he would just peg every single thing. Um, for the longest time at Creature, if a beer had a rough day on panel, there were only four people in the company who could clear it to move forward or decide what to do with it. Founder number one, founder number two, founder number three, and Jamie. Because <laughs> we trusted him that much. Um, his, his palate is ridiculous. He's, to this day, never missed an isoflaric spike. I don't know how. Um, so yeah, some uh, people definitely have their own strengths and weaknesses. Um, and it, it's coming to know that about yourself is one of the fun things with the training program. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> share a fun, uh, interesting fact about beer, uh, a his historical fact. Um, can I punt the ball on that one? Because I've got a slide later that's going to do exactly that. Is that all right? <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, it, folic, is there folic acid? What's the nutritional value of beer? Um, if we're being perfectly honest, um, the alcohol probably does more bad than any of the good y that you could get from it. <laughs> um, as far as the actual uh, nutrition, um, as far as uh, vitamins, I'm not completely sure. Um, you know, it does have a, a decent amount of protein, decent amount of sugars. Um, a 12 ounce can of Tropicalia is going to be right at 220 calories. Um, most beers, most craft beers that you see are going to be anywhere from about 150 to 250 calories per can. Um, the really, really light ones will get down to that those low hundreds and things like that. Um, but yeah, like a can of Tropicalia, about 220 calories. Um, and actually, a, most of those calories are coming from the alcohol. Um, cool. So, um, just a, a general um, word of note, that the fastest way to make a brewer cry is to store your beer warm. Um, don't do it. Uh, store your beer cold. Um, good. Bad. Um, it, beer ages very, very quickly when it's stored warm. Um, a beer that's been stored at room temp for two weeks is going to taste nothing like what it did previously um, if it were stored cold instead. Um, so, story beer cold. Um, some people, uh, there's, uh, there's a myth out there that beer can't go like hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. If you do that, you're going to mess with it. Honestly, just keep it cold. If, if it gets warm, get it cold. <laughs> um, it'll be fine. Uh, swap them back and forth, but cold is always best. Uh, so w what's next in the industry? You know, we talk about this collaborative nature, you know, all these groups, these science uh, uh, groups, these journals, you know. Uh, okay, w so what in the heck are we actually doing? Um, one of the biggest things in uh, craft beer right now is related to thiols, uh, sulfur compounds uh, that are in hops. And we're coming to a realization that these compounds are incredibly important to the aroma characteristics of some of the hops that we're really interested in now, the, the fruity tropical ones. Uh, some of those compounds, they can be like 4-MMP, 3-MH, 3-MHA. Um, 
these can most of these are hop drive. They can also come in on malt, and you can release these enzymatically uh, with certain yeast and stuff like that. Um, and they are being selected for uh, with uh, current hop breeding programs. So the hop quality group, the hops that we're selecting, we're actually quantifying these style compounds and using that as one of our decision factors on which ones to move forward in the process. Um, I've got a container of some of these compounds. Um, one of them is that 4-MMP. Humans can smell this down to 1.5 parts per trillion. Okay. Um, the last time we actually opened this jar, it made the entire brewery smell like cat piss for three days. Um, at high concentrations, it smells like cat piss. Low concentrations, it smells like passion fruit. Um, I've got a jar of that compound that's inside of another jar that's inside of a plastic tub that's inside of a plastic bag. I'm going to take that tub out of that plastic bag, and I'm going to open it for about two seconds. Um, and I've tested this out. I'm pretty sure it's not going to ruin this place. Um, but... <laughs> We're going to give it a shot. Um, this is one of the compounds that we are currently selecting for in our hop breeding programs. All right? You all ready? All right, we are purposely breeding for that in hops. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the last time we pipetted out of that bottle, we'd use one pipette tip and we put it in the garbage bin outside and the entire complex smelled like it for three days. Um, it, was, it was bad, it was bad, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah we... <laughs> Yeah, it's a sulfur compound. This particular one that we just smelled is that 4-MMP. It's a very long word that I can't remember. Um, but if you Google it, it'll be there. Um, but yeah. No, sorry, do what? Uh, it comes in with the hops. Yep. 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 Um, theoretically, probably. <laughs> you, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I can't guarantee how you'd feel the next day. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, but we're, we're highly, highly sensitive to it as humans. So this is one big thing. So this is uh, research that came out of Yakima Chief. Uh, there are a hop collective. Um, they were looking at these various compounds in different hop varieties, and they are now selectively breeding for them as well. Uh, there's also a lot of fun stuff going on with uh, yeast genetics and new yeast species. Um, their lager yeast is really, really fun. It's actually a hybrid of two different species, uh, Saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae and Saccharomyces eubionis. That leads to lager yeast, which is Saccharomyces pastorianus. Um, and the way those different parts of the genome interact and how they lead to different flavor compounds is a huge part of research right now. There's also new enzyme packages. Um, how those hop, uh, how these yeast can interact with hop compounds. Um, how there's a process called biotransformation. You know, we are using a biological thing to transform compounds from one thing into another and creating different aromas, um, reduced off flavors, stuff like that. Um, there's a really fantastic paper that came out in Nature Communications a little while ago, where one group they were able to create a strain of yeast that genetically produced hop compounds. Uh, two of them, uh, duraniol and linalool, and um, they were able to make beer that official sensory panel said this tastes like a pale ale. Didn't have a single hop in it. Uh, they were very excited, so they spun it off into a whole company uh, called Berkeley Yeast, and now they are making all kinds of fun, interesting uh, new yeast strains that can do some really cool things. Um, there's also a phenomenon called hop creep. This is my promised slide, um, going back to history. Uh, so hop creep is a really, really interesting thing. Uh, if you hop during fermentation, you can actually dramatically change the sugar profile. Um, there is something coming in with the hops that is able to turn unfermentable sugars into fermentable sugars. And so you'll actually get a further fermentation uh, if you're adding hops uh, in the middle of the process. It can be incredibly frustrating because it can lead to some weird off flavors and stuff like that. And then your, you know, your beer isn't doing what you want it to. Um, what's particularly frustrating about this one is they knew about it. They knew about it. They knew about it in 1893. Um, this is that same Brewer's Guardian paper. 
And this was a, a series of two uh, articles that they published uh, uh, just a couple weeks apart. And they knew about hop creep. And then the industry, we forgot about it for 100 years. <laughs> um, and now uh, we're uh, uh, rediscovering it. Uh, Bell's Brewing has done a lot of fantastic research on hop creep. Um, Russian River has done a lot of fantastic research on hop creep. Um, there are a lot, of, a lot of groups that are really figuring it out. Um, but yeah, it, it is something that we actually knew about um, over 100 years ago. Um, but craft brewers rediscovered it, um, painfully rediscovered it, uh, and now we're trying to fix it. Uh, but what is Creature Comforts uh, doing with the industry? You know, how, how are we playing into this whole collaborative effort and the science of everything? Um, so we actually did a really, really large product, uh, project looking at uh, metallic qualities and kettle soured beers. Uh, kettle soured beers are where in the brew house, in the kettle in the brew house, you're purposely adding lactobacillus, the same uh, bacteria that creates yogurt. Uh, you're allowing it to create lactic acid, um, and then you're sending that beer into the fermenter to create beer. Uh, so it makes these nice tart beers like Berliner Weisses, our Athena, Tritonia, Paradisos, all of those are kettle sour beers. Um, they have a tendency to become kind of metallic and taste like blood or pennies. Not enjoyable. Uh, so we did a whole thing figuring out how to combat that very robustly. Um, and then we told everyone. We didn't keep it proprietary. We didn't keep it to ourselves. Uh, there's actually an MBAA podcast episode. You can listen to Spencer Britton, our research manager, literally tell the world how to do what we figured out. Um, we've done genetic sequencing, uh, 40 different mixed culture samples. Um, so these are those funky fermentations that have you know wild yeast and bacteria. I sequenced 40 different samples from 18 different breweries, uh, presented on that at ASBC. Uh, we're looking at uh, whenever you hop during fermentation, that dry hopping, uh, it actually leads to an increase in pH. Uh, you know, we talk about pH being important for product stability and safety, and so that's actually pretty scary. And so we're actually, we got $16,000 from the Hop Quality Group to uh, try to figure out uh, that problem. Um, we're pretty sure we know the compound, we're just uh, chewing through it. Um, Looking at new qPCR methods for detecting contamination in beer, that's a big project that I've published on uh, before. And then, um, our house lactobacillus that we use for our kettle souring, um, it's its own species. Um, I want to publish on lactobacillus creatura in a few years when it mutates again, we'll have lactobacillus comfortiti. Uh, most breweries, when they're doing kettle sours, uh, it takes 24 to 48 hours for the bacteria to create the, the level of lactic acid that they want. Ours does it in four. Um, it's a lot of fun. I love it. Um, and I've, I, I've done full genetic sequencing on it. It's, it's, yeah, it's its own beast, but, uh, we're still waiting to publish that one. It'll be fun. That's it. Um, happy to take any questions. That's a really good question. I don't actually know the answer to it. Um, uh, the ca it's, 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 it's probably a different compound, except for that portion of it, that thiol, is almost as surely hitting the same receptors. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Has 4MMP ever been used for crowd control? I mean, if things got rowdy here, it pr probably could. <laughs> yeah, not to my knowledge, but it, it would it would be effective. Um, people did not like coming to work uh, <laughs> when we had it uh, very strong at the brewery. Um, yeah, a couple in the back. How do we figure the alcohol content? Yep, for the different brands. Uh, so a couple different ways. Uh, so the biological process for yeast turning sugars into ethanol, um, it's very well known. And so if you know you're starting sugars and you know you're finishing ethanol or you're finishing sugars and you did nothing to that beer other than put yeast in it, you know how much alcohol was produced. That's how most brewers do it. Um, now, when it gets weird is if you're doing something like a bourbon barrel aged stout, you know, that barrel had booze in it, it's going to get into your beer. Um, and so that can throw off the calculations. So that DMA 4500 that we have, it has a specific unit on it that's actually measuring alcohol in the beer. What? 
what do I think about brewing kits? Um, they're fun. They're fantastic. I, I home brewed for years. It's what got me into the industry. Yep. They're a lot of fun. Other culinary uh, uses or practical uses for hops. Um, yeah, the, a lot of things can be done with hops. They're pretty fun. Um, some breweries now are doing um, hopped seltzer waters, so completely non-alcoholic but still hoppy. Um, so those are a lot of fun. Um, hops also, like traditionally, one of the reasons why we've used them, um, they have highly antimicrobial properties. Uh, so you can actually uh, get some antimicrobial effects uh, from hops, and um, they're are companies that will extract those compounds and sell them for various uses. Yeah, great question. Uh, that is a different compound. The cat piss in wine that they are typically talking about is THP, tetrahydropyridine. Um, it is commonly, the common descriptors for it are cat piss or it tastes like someone slapped a graham cracker on your tongue. Um, it, it, it even feels kind of crackery. It's weird. Um, and so THB, we, we'll actually see it in beers as well, especially beers that were fermented with Britannomyces. Um, when you package them, oxygen ingress leads to a spike in THP, and it can take several weeks for that uh, to be cleared. So our packaged funky beers, we actually hold them for at least 12 weeks, and a large portion of that is to clear them from THP because, uh, yeah, it's that same cat piss. Um, you know, a, a Sauvignon um, is going to have, like, a decent bit of THP in it, stuff like that. Great question. Sorry, I'm gonna let you moderate. <laughs> uh, are there beers that lactose intolerant people shouldn't drink? Yes. Uh, so, well, the lactobacillus doesn't have lactose, but brewers will add lactose to beers. Um, and the biggest reason why brewers do that is because lactose is not fermentable by yeast. So it's a way to make the beer sweet and sugary, um, but also be stable, and it's not going to create alcohol. So for us, um, Cocoa Bunny, um, we call it a milk porter. Milk, we add lactose to it. Um, it creates a nice bigger body, but yeah. Um, it, all brewers are required by the FDA to label allergens on their beer. Um, so if a, a brewer is doing what they're legally required to do, if it has lactose, it will say so on the package. Um, yeah. Uh, Creature Conference is privately owned. Yes. Uh, we do tours at the downtown facility, um, uh, the original facility downtown. Yep. Yep, um, and we are um, we have done tours at the big facility um, for certain groups and stuff like that. It's not something that we commonly or like openly offer. Um, we're we're thinking about it, um, but yeah, the uh, we have the two facilities right now, um, and then the LA facility will be open soon. And I don't know if we'll do tours there or not. Probably, but yeah. We hope you enjoyed this presentation. For more information on Science for Georgia's mission and our past work, visit our website at scienceforgeorgia.org.